Debt is like any other trap, easy enough to get into but hard enough to get out of, because he who is quick to borrow is slow to pay. China, who is the most aware of this, has created a belt around India that restricts the decision making of New Delhi by employing its checkbook policy. India is now attempting to equal the playing field with its own alternative discourse, known as the Necklace of Diamonds, extending from Central Asia through Japan, Vietnam, Indonesia, Singapore, and Seychelles. Creating a containment block around China is the goal of Oman and Iran. In addition to conducting joint defense exercises and economic partnerships expansions, New Delhi is also establishing industrial corridors and quite recently it has been concluding game-changing armament agreements. For India and China, the idea of suffocating the other is central to their geopolitical strategies. Whether through a string of pearls or a necklace of diamonds, both secret countries rule the Asia-Pacific region and end up leaving the rivals' economies in the dust. Even though wars in distant countries like China and India appear insignificant, their negative effects can be felt in your savings and wallet. Last year, the pace of economic growth in China was the slowest in almost a century. India is like a grand castle, standing tall and proud, yet its long, curving coast exposes it to the elements. The Indian Ocean makes up almost a fifth of the water on the planet's surface, spans three continents, 28 nations, and is a major trade route, connecting the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. While the Indian Ocean promotes prosperity through trade, it has also historically served as a point of entry for colonial empires. The string of pearls is the code to China's current efforts to carry out this policy. Mombasa, Djibouti, Karachi, Gwadar, Colombo, Hambantota, Chattogram, Sitwe, and the Coco Islands are all stops along the road. Like a pearl diver, China has plied the depths of the Indian Ocean for priceless pearls, but geopolitics is frequently fueled by a voracious need. Beijing is actively seeking dual use rights in the port of Dukam in Oman, building a deep water port in Kenya's Lamu Island, and urging the Maldives to create a submarine facility at Marao. But as China's debt trap policy has added more pearls to its necklace, a trail of broken promises has been left in its wake. Countries that are heavily indebted and unable to pay back loans are forced to make geostrategic uh, compromises. There are plenty of legitimate frustrations. India is attempting to profit from these concerns, leading to the Necklace of Diamond strategy, through which New Delhi aspires to establish a security edifice by growing its naval presence abroad, forming new military alliances, and extending its force projection throughout the Asia Pacific. Incapacitation of China's string of pearls is the ultimate objective. India has been engaged in a diplomatic frenzy since its disclosure, signing agreements left and right. Seychelles decided in 2015 to build a naval outpost on Assumption Island that would be leased only to the Indian Navy. India would have a base of operations on the continent of Africa if they gained a foothold in the Seychelles. The presence of the Chinese in Djibouti and Kenya might be resisted by the Indian Navy with the correct tools. Moreover, Assumption Island is situated close to the Mozambique Channel through which a significant amount of maritime traffic travels. Iran and India agreed to build Shah Bahar's first deep water port a year later in 2016. The North South Transportation Corridor, which connects Mumbai to Moscow via Iran and Azerbaijan, would be accessible to India from Chabahar onward. Having a stake in Chabahar immediately competes with China's presence in Karachi and the Gwadar port, at least from the standpoint of India. India acquired entrance to the key port of Dukam in Oman in addition to the Iranian port. India's seaborne hydrocarbon imports from the Gulf were reinforced after the pact signing in 2018 thanks to its presence on the Arabian Peninsula. A counterpoint to those Chinese strongholds is also provided by Dukam Port, which is strategically situated between Gwadar and Djibouti. Dukam is special because it is close to the Strait of Hormuz, one of the most significant choke points in the globe. Hence, India kills not only two but three birds with one stone. 
Furthermore, in 2018, New Delhi in S and Singapore struck a contract allowing the Indian Navy to get logistical support at Singapore's Changi Naval Station, including rearmament and fueling. Because it permits India to enroach into the South China Sea, the Singapore Accord differs from the earlier agreements. One such base is obviously insufficient, but that same year India and Indonesia also agreed to a pact that granted the Indonesian military access to Sabangkot, which is conveniently placed at the northern entrance to the Malacca Strait. Intriguingly, the Sabangkot has a depth of roughly 40 meters. India might so use it as a submarine base. In either case, the Malacca Strait represents a strategic liability for Beijing, but a chance for New Delhi since almost 80% of China's imports of crude oil and natural gas travel through it. The Andaman and Nicobar Archipelago, which is located north of the Malacca Channel, has also been militarized by India since 2020. The more resources the Indian Navy can transport to the edge, the more leverage New Delhi has with Beijing. Yet in addition to strengthening naval bases, India is also making efforts to improve relations with the countries that surround China. In order to increase trade, tourism and intercultural exchange, India and Mongolia decided to build a bilateral aviation corridor in 2015. Mongolia aspires to equal footing in negotiations with either China or Russia, which would aid Mongolia in balancing its policy making. As part of his extensive tour of Central Asia in 2015, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi met with the presidents of Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. With its hydrocarbon reaches, Central Asia is a region brimming with possibilities. It is a market with hundreds of millions of people and has precious minerals, uranium, resources, and hydropower potential. During Modi's visit, trade between India and the Central Asian nations has increased by twofold and it is expected to increase even higher. India can limit the influence of competitor nations to a greater extent the more influence it can exert in Central Asia. The Asia-Africa Growth Corridor was a project that Japan and India jointly launched later in 2017. Its objective is to build infrastructure, accelerate economic growth, and increase New Delhi's and Tokyo's power while competing with China's influence in Africa. With almost all of the countries that surround China, all things considered, India has maintained positive relations. It's not all roses and peaches, though. In comparison to China's string of pearls, India's diamond necklace is frequently viewed as weak. This lack of faith is particularly evident throughout Southeast Asia. Although the Asian nations recognize India's many accomplishments, they have doubts about India's will and ability to compete with China. This uncertainty is primarily the result of India's infamous bureaucracy's failure to fulfill prior commitments. Even outside the Asian region, there are issues. Some of the contracts are in doubt. For example, China has enormous lobbying influence in the Seychelles where the country has wavered on its obligations to both India and China. Since Iran is subject to stringent sanctions, Indian businesses have had difficulty conducting business there. In order to protect Indian companies from more fines, workarounds are continuously being explored. China is more wealthy than India and can invest money where India cannot. China has so far made roughly $60 billion worth of investments in Africa's portion of the string of pearls, whereas India's highest investment so far was $8 billion in the Chabar port. Currently, New Delhi has little control over many of these drawbacks, yet India has oversight and has slightly deteriorated its sales of weapons. For context, India has established coastal radar stations and control systems in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the Seychelles, and the Maldives. China, however, has given its allies more advanced weapons like submarines, combat aircraft, and so forth, despite the fact that these defensive systems are appreciated. Arms sales are a fantastic method to enhance relationships and create powerful alliances. China has mastered the art of selling weapons and as a result it has strengthened its position throughout Asia-Pacific. Yet India has begun to capitalize on the niche of weaponry sales as it learns from past errors. 
the Philippines and Vietnam were invited to buy supersonic missiles by India's Brahmos Aerospace as recently as December 2022. Both countries are highly wary of and hostile to Beijing because they both lie on the periphery of China's boundaries. The Brahmos cruise missile, which travels at a speed of roughly three times the speed of sound, is the fastest in the world. It may be launched from ground launchers, aircraft, and submarine warships and can carry a 200 clue warhead. These weapons going to Vietnam and the Philippines are obviously upsetting in Beijing. But whether it's the rule of pearls or the diamond of necklace, that is ultimately the goal of grand strategy. By controlling the terms of commerce, India and China have the right to strangle one another. It's war by means, other means, and it's not surprising that as New Delhi develops and competitively ups the ante on its necklace of diamond plan, arms sales will play a more and bigger part because selling weapons is selling power. So guys, this was for today. Give us your thoughts on this in the comment section and if you appreciate our content, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Share this video with your family and friends. We will meet soon in a new video. Thank you. Jai Hind.